If you've been watching this channel for a while, or studying history at all for that matter, you're surely aware that wars are a hotbed for the straight up ridiculous. Against the backdrop of the Russo-Japanese War, one particularly ridiculous, no ludicrous incident took place in the North Sea, involving the Imperial Russian Navy, and in quotation marks, some Japanese torpedo boats. What we're referring to is, of course, the Dogger Bank incident, which put some serious strain on Anglo-Russian relations and absolutely shamed Imperial Russia. In this video, we're going to dive right in to that Foster Clock. Early in February 1904, tensions between Russia and Japan over influence in Manchuria and Korea boiled over when Japanese naval forces attacked the Russian Pacific Fleet in Port Arthur, Manchuria. While the battle was over by the 9th of February that same year, it marked the beginning of the Russo-Japanese War and fighting continued in the Yellow Sea for the rest of 1904 and beyond. In October 1904, the Imperial Russian Navy decided that that theatre could use a little extra attention and called upon the Baltic Fleet, which was just chilling in the Baltic Sea at the time. Loading the fleet onto the back of a truck and hauling it across Eurasia wasn't really an option however, so the situation called for a bit of a round the continent play, with the fleet departing the Baltic Sea through the North Sea and then proceeding via the British held Suez Canal around Eurasia into the Yellow Sea after which it could wage war on the Japanese in the Sea of Japan. It was a bold operation to which the Russians ironically assigned only their very worst naval personnel. The outcome was a steaming hot mess, and that's putting it mildly. In the lead up to the Baltic Fleet's departure, there was a lot of tension in the air. Russian naval intelligence suggested that the Japanese might have, somehow, preempted their round the continent play and sent some of their own forces halfway around the world to intercept them, and the men in charge of the fleet, Admiral Zinovy Rotzetsdiensky, had also told sailors to be on extra, extra high alert. Serving only to tighten the already taut string, the Russians were particularly afraid of torpedo boats, which were a relatively new naval threat in the early 1900s, and had even come to believe that Japanese torpedo boats posing as fishing boats were operating in the North Sea. If that wasn't enough cause for concern, the Japanese and British were actually hella bros at this point in time, having formalized their bromance with the 1902 Anglo-Japanese alliance, so it wasn't unreasonable to think that the Japanese could have worked with the British to set up some sort of ambush. As it would turn out, however, most, if not all, of the Baltic fleet's apprehension was the consequence of poor intelligence and a collective nervousness which unfortunately reached a crescendo when British civilians, not Japanese military personnel, were in the area. It started on the night of the 21st of October, when the Baltic fleet approached the Doggerbank area of the North Sea, where a British trawling fleet known as the Gamecock fleet just happened to be going about its business. Intending to identify themselves, the fishing vessels turned on their lights and fired flares, but these signals were misidentified by the Russians, who apparently thought the flares were some sort of weapon. Even after bringing the fishing vessels to light with their powerful searchlights, the Baltic fleet still opened fire, certain they had Japanese torpedo boats in their sights. Cannon fire struck the British trawler Crane, ending two lives and sinking the vessel, though most of the crewmen were able to escape. Realizing that the Russians weren't buying the truth, the rest of the Gamecock fleet tried to flee, but were slowed by their trawling nets, which pretty much rendered them sitting ducks in the face of the Russian onslaught. But this so-called onslaught was actually more of a fireworks display than a cannonade. The Baltic fleet fired thousands of projectiles at the Gamecock fleet, with the battleship Oriol firing over 500 shells on its own, and for all that fuss, they only managed to damage an additional two trawlers and injured a few more sailors. The gunmen of the Baltic fleet were that bad. And, as if that wasn't embarrassing enough, in the pure chaos of it all, the Russians mistook some of their own warships for the enemy, with friendly fire aimed at the Russian battleship Aurora, 
leading to the deaths of a Russian sailor and a Russian priest. When the Russians finally figured out that the Gamecock fleet was not indeed a fleet of Japanese torpedo boats, rather than rush to their aid, they gave it legs, leaving the trawlers to limp back to the British coast, which was some 96 kilometers or 60 miles away. Before we go into what the Baltic fleet got up to after that mess, it's important to understand that the Dogger Bank incident was not an isolated event. In fact, something very similar went down earlier that day. Having fallen behind the rest of the fleet, the Russian supply ship Kamchatka bumped into a trio of, in quotation marks, Japanese warships and summarily attacked them, firing over 300 shells at what turned out to be a Swedish merchantman, a German trawler, and a French schooner, all without landing a hit. While the Baltic fleet was freaking the heck out, the British Empire prepared to go to war with Russia and even stalked the Russian fleet as it fled down the English Channel into the Bay of Biscay. Trying to dig themselves out of the hole the Baltic fleet had dug, the Russian Navy ordered the fleet to dock in Vigo, Spain, where Admiral Rostinevsky could catch his breath while the Russian government figured out a more diplomatic solution than going to war with the Brits. Before any such solution was finalized though, the Baltic fleet was allowed to leave Spain so long as Rostinevsky left behind the officers he believed were responsible for the Dogger Bank incident. The OG plan of going through the Suez Canal, however, had been abandoned, as some of the fleet's newer, larger warships would have bottomed out. While this put a spanner in the works, the Russian Navy was still pretty keen on backdooring the Japanese in the Yellow Sea and the Sea of Japan, so they simply changed things up a bit. Instead of sailing under Eurasia, the larger warships took a little detour around the entire continent of Africa. After a 32,000 km or 20,000 mile journey which lasted several months, the Baltic fleet, having regrouped, finally arrived in the Sea of Japan just in time for the Battle of Tsushima, which took place on the 27th and 28th of May 1905. The Russians probably wished they had just stayed in Spain or Madagascar or something because the fleet got its backside handed to it by the Japanese in this tragic engagement with over 5,000 Russian sailors losing their lives, as opposed to just 117 Japanese dead. They had gone around the world just to embarrass themselves and then get crushed. Earlier that year, however, the Russians and British were able to iron out the Dogger Bank incident, with Admiral Rostyanevsky essentially getting off the hook and a compensation of £66,000 paid out to the British fishermen. As of 2014, that would have been equivalent to around £5 million. But we're interested to hear what you think. Had you heard of the Dogger Bank incident before today? Do you think it's somewhat funny that the only reason so many British fishermen survived is that the Russians couldn't aim? And lastly, make sure you keep an eye out for our video following up on this, going into detail about the worst ship in this already pretty bad fleet, that ship being the Kamchatka. You won't believe the absolute state of this crew, so keep your eyes peeled, that should be coming next week. And just before you head off to that next suggested video guys, make sure you check out our new channel called The Braved, where we go deep into history to find some of the most badass individuals from all different eras. And if you're more so into the music side of things, check out our Relax Jack music channel where we use a lot of the music from that channel and use it in the videos here, including in the intro. And if you want to get access to our behind the scenes discord where you can chat to myself and the team who make these videos and get access to a couple of exclusive videos, check out the Patreon. And if you just want to join us on our wider socials, check us out on Instagram, Facebook and our discord server. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.